Hello everybody, welcome to lesson 6.5 for geometry and also welcome to the beach. I'm going to do this one today at the beach. Beautiful Encinitas, California. I'm going barefoot today here as we learn about trapezoids and kites. So let's get into it, let's get at it and let's see what we've got here in this lesson. So, here's your new vocabulary, talking about some things about trapezoids and then some things about kites, more terminology with trapezoids than the kites. Uh, make sure you're using those extra examples in your book and let's get going on this. This one is going to be fun, it's going to be nice. You might hear some background noise there, hopefully my voice will be loud enough to carry over that. Uh, but just imagine you're at the beach right now and you're hearing these things at the beach and that'll make it all better. Alright, so a quadrilateral a trapezoid is a quadrilateral that has exactly one pair. It's got to be exactly one pair of parallel sides. So if you were to draw a trapezoid, this is just a general trapezoid, it looks something like this. There's some pretty big waves here. Woo! Should definitely try to go surfing later on. So right there and right there, those would be the two parallel sides. These two are not allowed to be parallel. A parallelogram has exactly two pairs. It has two pairs of parallel sides. But this trapezoid only has one. And so we've got some special names for some of these other parts as well. These are called, right here and right here, these are called the legs. These are the non-parallel parts. So a leg and a leg right here and right here. And then these are called the bases. This is a base and another base. These are the parallel parts. So let's get out a different color at this point. I want you to make a note of that. So the base, this is a non-parallel part. And the leg is a parallel. Or, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm too focused on the waves coming in. This is the parallel part. This is the non-parallel part. My fault on that. This is the non-parallel part. And then an isosceles trapezoid. There we go, that's how you spell isosceles. An isosceles trapezoid. is a trapezoid where you have isosceles parts. We have the legs being the same length, just like an isosceles triangle has two legs of the same length. An isosceles trapezoid has the legs, two legs of the same length. So it's a trapezoid where the legs are congruent. And it looks something like this. This is, an, in a sense, an upside down one, I guess you could say. This is my freehand sketch of that. That shouldn't cross over there. Sorry, there we go. But these two things being the same, these two sides being parallel, that would be an isosceles trapezoid, an example of that. We need a couple of theorems to go along with this, actually three different theorems. This one's going to be 614. This one will be 615. And this one will be 616. And so I'll draw a sketch here of a trapezoid. And then this one's going to be, make it, or draw it to be an isosceles trapezoid, make it look like an isosceles trapezoid. And let's actually draw that so that it must be, if that's drawn in like that, that must be an isosceles trapezoid. This is what it says, if you have an isosceles trapezoid, that implies that the base angles are congruent. And so get out your different color. It's important that we have a different color for this. That means that this angle would be congruent to this one, and this angle would be congruent to this one. Let me put two on this one here and here, and then this one's congruent to that one. So 
In other words, what it says, let's put this still in a different color. Angle A is congruent to angle B. I need to draw those letters in there a second. I'll do that in just a second. Angle C is congruent to angle D. And so where are A, B, C, and D located? That should be right here. A, B, and C, and D. Ooh, a quiet moment. All right. The waves died down in just a second. Theorem 615 says if you have this, then this is going to be true. Notice this just goes in one direction. This is not a biconditional statement. It just goes from the, the left side to the right side. So this one I want you to draw to make look isosceles again. But we're not going to put the, the legs as being congruent yet. We are going to say it's a trapezoid. And this time we are going to say that one of the base angles are the same. Well, let's go with A, B, C, and D again. So this one says if you have one pair of base angles being congruent, if that's true, that implies that you have an isosceles trapezoid. And oops, let me spell that or abbreviate that correctly, isos. Isosceles trapezoid. So it's the converse, in, not in a sense, I was going to say in a sense, but it is the converse of what we have over here, except for this would say they're both the same. This one, you just need one pair of base angles to be the same to have an isosceles trapezoid. Therefore, in red, add in the different color, we could also say this. So if the black stuff was true, the red stuff would also have to be true. It would have to follow from what we have there. And so let's, in red, draw what follows from the theorem. So if this was true, if the, this part was true, this would have to be true. What's red is the part of the theorem that can be proven, basically. Uh, so ABCD must be an isosceles trapezoid. Isosceles, I can't even, can't spell, it's hard to, sorry, it's a little hard to see the screen here at the beach. Now I'm just making excuses because I'm at the beach. So it must be an isosceles trapezoid. Yes, I'm at the beach. It is nice to be here. I'm more of a mountain man, but I like the beach too. It's it's pretty nice to be here. Okay, and theorem 616. Draw a picture that looks something like this. And then we can say that in this one, I'm going to leave the diagonals out right now. But this one, you start with an isosceles trapezoid again. Man, I keep doing that. Isosceles trapezoid. So if you start with that, that implies, and this one works both directions. So I'm going to actually put the diagonals in there in black in the same color might be starting with that instead of this. Why don't I, and why don't you actually change the color of some of these things? Let's erase that because you may be starting off with either one of these things. So the red stuff can kind of be proven in a sense. So uh, why don't I just erase the whole picture? You don't have to erase your whole picture. I'm just going to make this just easier for me to do that that way. So. I'm going to make my isosceles looking trapezoid again. Oops. And then we definitely have to start off with that being true. But then you may be proving either this part's true or you may be proving that the diagonals are congruent to one another. Since they cross, there's really not a nice place to put the tick marks. So we're just going to kind of assume or read down there what's true about it. So if you have an isosceles tra trapezoid, that means the diagonals are congruent. And if you have diagonals that are congruent, that means you also have an isosceles trapezoid. So this works in both directions. This works both ways. And so what is that saying in words? Put this in our different color again. It says that AB, I need to draw the letters in there once again. So here's A. B, C, and D. So that A, B, 
CD. Is an isosceles trapezoid if and only if that is biconditional remember from chapter two bi biconditional statements have that phrase if and only if if and only if AC is congruent to BD those diagonals are congruent to one another so those are three theorems about isosceles trapezoid now let's do an example with a trapezoid and so this one I'm going to use, I'm just drawing this freehand, just draw yours freehand as best you can unless you really want to use tools or straight edges. So let's assume that this is an isosceles trapezoid and I'm going to go with the letters P, E, A and K for peak and here's our peak. If I actually cut this peak, this is just for fun, but if I were to cut this peak right here and maybe continue the base that way and that way, I can see where that part would actually be an isosceles trapezoid. Pretty cool. Uh, so, anyways, so, let's go back to the problem. But I'm always seeing math everything. I just made an isosceles trapezoid out of a very sweet mountain in the High Sierras. You should hike in the High Sierras. It's an amazing place to go. Uh, one of the most beautiful places in the world, I think. But let's say, here with example one, that P E A K is an isosceles trapezoid. Like you see here. That's definitely true. So I'll say it's isosceles trapezoid trapezoid as drawn. So what can we say about certain things here? Let's see if we can figure these things out. So what the measure of K B and we'll give justifications for each one of these things too. We can actually find the measures of all four angles if we just have that one and we know it's an isosceles trapezoid. So what's K? What's E? And what is A? K is going to be the same thing as, let's get our different color out again, K is the same thing as P because of the theorem we just learned about back here. That if you have an isosceles trapezoid, that means the base angles are the same. And so that's going to use theorem 614 as a justification for that. So back to back to black and we have 40 degrees. Just saw a seagull fly over me. Let's hope he doesn't poop on my laptop. That would stink. <laughs> stink. Okay. That would be by theorem 614. If you wanted to write out a description of 614 you can do that too. Uh, but that's that theorem right there. Now E, why is E going to be I can definitely say it's going to be 140. Why would that work out though? So 40, this one's got to be 140. I know these two have to be the same. If this one's 40 and this one's 40, I can do 360 minus those two and then divide that by two. Or I could just notice that, hey, these two are supposed to be parallel to each other. That means these two are consecutive interior angles, which are supposed to add to 180. And so therefore that would have to be 140. So we can say it's 140 since Consecutive interior angles are supplementary. Remember, you have to have parallel lines for that to be the case, but we do have parallel lines here, so those are going to be supplementary. And then you could also say the same thing, either this reason again, or you could use this reason for the final one, 140. I'm going to just say that's got to be true, because this is 40, that one would also have to be 140. That's one way to say it, but actually what I wanted to say is that this one and this one are the same, if I'm going to use theorem 614. That's what we have here and here. Okay. And so if you added all these together, 140 plus 140 is 280, plus 40 more is 320, plus 40 more is 360. I just did a verbal check, uh, but you should, if you, you can't do that math in your head, math in your head, then you should check that out by actually working it out and working it out on paper to see that it adds to 360 like it should. All right, let's go to a, another example. After saying one more thing, it looks like, though, yes, we have to, to do the mid-segment theorem for trapezoids. Uh, but let's write this down as a note. If I have you do, in the, in the work, for number 37, I think I may have you do that one in your classwork. For number 37, 
I want you to write this note down. See example two on page 357. So for, for that one, see example two on page 357, that's going to help you out to do that one. And then theorem, let me just check this a second. Yep. So theorem 617 now. This is the mid-segment theorem. And that should kind of tell you what it's all about. Mid-segment theorem, remember that mid-segment is kind of like a halfway segment. Mid-segment theorem for trapezoids. And if you wanted to look at the page to see this a little more in depth, it's on page 357. So mid-segment theorem for trapezoids tells you, let's first draw a trapezoid. This is not necessarily an isosceles trapezoid, so I'm trying to draw it so it doesn't look like necessarily an isosceles trapezoid. But something like this. Let's go with this being A, B, C, and D. And then I want you to have this here as the midpoint for that side. So this is M, and then this one's going to be the midpoint for that side. We're going to call it N. These are the same. If we connect M and N, what the theorem says, and let's write that off to the side before we write that down though. MN is, not N, MN is, segment MN is the mid segment. What the theorem says is this. It says two things actually. MN, segment MN is parallel to segment AD. And it also says MN parallel to BC. I forgot to add that in my picture. I meant to say that that was parallel to that to start as well. Plus, so this is one thing that's true, plus you also can say that MN is half of the length of the two bases put together. It's half the length of AD plus BC. So it's, in other words, it's the average of the length of the two bases. So it's halfway in between. If you were to take the measurement from here to here, and the measurement from here to here, MN is going to be halfway in between those two measurements. It's the average of those two lengths. Looking at this picture, that should make sense because if I made like a line right here and right here, that's going to be halfway in between those two. So it's the difference between those two, half of that. Same thing over here and here. It's the difference between those two right there. So let's do example two, and let's see what we got for that. So something like this. Yeah, I'm trying to draw a straight line. It's skipping around on me. So there we go. Something like that. Still skipped a little bit, but we can deal with that. Something like that. And then EZ. I'm going to draw a dotted line for this one just because I felt like it. This is going to be E. That's going to be Z, and we're going to say that the letters here are going to be P, A, R, and T. And I'm going to say this is 6, and this is 12. So A, R is 6, and P, T is 12. And let's also assume that this is true, that this and this are parallel. And so if I were to ask you to find EZ, let's put this in here too. Bug just flew into my face, sorry. Go away, fly, there we go. So I've got this and this. That means that EZ is the mid-segment from looking at this. So we can say that EZ is mid-segment of trapezoid. Trapezoid trap. This is actually T R A P. I did that for a trapezoid. Uh, so it's the mid segment of that trapezoid. So we can say so by theorem, the theorem we just saw, theorem 617. We can say that EZ equals half 
of those two added together. It's the average of those two segments. So what's half of these two added together is 18. Half of 18 is nine. If you think of that back here in the context of your picture, nine, that should make sense. It's halfway in between six and 12. And so that is our answer for something like that. All right, let's check out some information about kites and then we will call it a day at the beach here today. So a kite, what is a kite? A kite is a quadrilateral and it's, it looks like a, a kite that we're used to seeing flying in the sky. It's a kite, it's a quadrilateral like you can see over here. We got a kite over here. It's a quadrilateral that has of consecutive so right in a row consecutive congruent sides but opposite sides are not congruent so if I were to draw a picture of a kite I'll do a quick picture of a kite over here it looks like this. So draw this off to the side. That is horrible looking. With this free hand as best I can. So here's two consecutive right in a row congruent sides. I'm saying that one is congruent to that one. And then two other ones. Something like this and this. But opposite sides, you notice this one is not congruent to this one. And this one is not congruent. So this one opposite sides are not congruent. And then the two theorems to go along with this. Theorem 618. Theorem 6, 19, say this, I'm going to draw more horizontally oriented kites for these two. So we can draw, let's draw our kites in first, something like that, and like that, boom, 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 all right, we got kites now at that point. Okay, and then in a different color, I want you to draw in the diagonals on this one. And then this one will just leave blank for right now. Let's call this A, B, C, and D. Oh, guys, <laughs> there's a little kid chasing a seagull right now. I don't know if you can hear him going by in the, the distance, but it's pretty cool, pretty funny. All right, and so with this one, we have a kite. If you have a kite, like what do you hear? If you start with that, that implies that this is actually true, that AC, which is one of the diagonals in the picture, is perpendicular to BD. Not BC, BD. Said the right thing and wrote down the wrong thing. So that tells you that that is the case. This we drew it in a different color. So let's add one more thing to there. We can put that in there as well. So the diagonals are perpendicular. Not congruent, but perpendicular. Hopefully you can just look at those and say, yeah, that's BD is not gonna be the same length as AC, but they are gonna be perpendicular. And if you have something like theorem 619, if you start with a kite, that also tells you that you have exactly one pair of opposite, not off, but of, of opposite, not sides, but angles. The sides can't, opposite angles, or opposite sides can't be congruent in, in respect or looking at the definition of a kite, but opposite angles. One pair of opposite angles is going to be congruent. And if you look at the picture, the way I'm going to label this, hopefully you could look at this angle right here and this angle right here and tell that one of those is a little bigger than the other, but these are the two that are going to be congruent. And so not these two, not B and D, but A and C, those ones, are going to be congruent to one another. So we can say that angle A, this is in a different color again, angle A is congruent to angle C, 
wherever you, you see me doing red, that's stuff you're doing in a different color. We can say that angle B, however, is not congruent to, so I'm going to put a congruent symbol, but then put a slash through it to signify that not congruent to angle D. And then finally, to finish up, this is the last little note I want you to write down for help. We'll do some stuff with kites together in class for some guided practice type things. For up though with kite homework, classwork homework, problems. See examples four and five on pages 358. I think they're pretty straightforward, so hopefully you can just look at those and see what they're saying and, and uh, apply that to the problems you're working on. But again, one more time, one more look at the beach. Welcome to beautiful Encinitas, California again. Yep, that's right, barefoot, doing lessons, doing math at the beach. Doesn't get, life doesn't get much better than that, does it? No, no, life cannot get much better than doing math at the beach. Beautiful. Okay, and I'm, I'm using my pen on my laptop. No, this goes over here. This goes, if you ever wondered what I'm writing on, then if you're not in my class, I'm writing on this slate thing. And so here we go. Farewell. So long. Farewell. It's been nice doing the lesson at the beach together with you. I will catch you later.